to give kind of an overview of, of the work that we've been doing at McMaster over a number of years related to this, this topic. And, um, and particularly, as, as, we, as was just mentioned, <clears throat> looking at um, this sort of a universal route to making nanoparticles from solution that are highly organized and highly monodispersed in terms of their, um, their diameters, for example. So functional nanoparticles cover a wide range of different industries and can be utilized in different um, composite materials or as, uh, as just monodispersed systems within nanoparticle film systems for isolators, batteries, nanomedicine, biosensors, water splitting. It really um, scans the range of, of different industries. But one of the, the things that's limited the ability of nanoparticles to really take over in terms of some of these microelectronic devices or different kinds of device systems is that the scalability to the industrial scale is often limited by the heterogeneous nature of the, the particles. So often you have um, various diameters of particles, you have a target average diameter, but the, the spread in the diameters is quite large. And so really our interest in trying to move these particles from things that are academically interesting into an industrial sense is to try to strive for uniform nanostructures. And for high performance, you really want something that looks like my little schematic here, where you have uniform monodispersed nanoparticles that form in, in organized arrays. And that's really the things that we're very much interested in is observing the behavior of nanoparticles, trying to quantify their structure, their two-dimensional structure, in order to model the mechanisms of, of nanoparticle formation so that we can utilize them in devices. And at the research group, at my Organic Electronic Interfaces Research Group, uh, we're really focused on tailoring surfaces, interfaces, and heterojunctions, particularly for emerging devices. So including solar cells, uh, letamine diodes, sensors, different kinds of microelectronics. And, um, and though I'm going to focus mostly on our synthesis portion, we really like to go from through the whole gamut, right? Right from one dimensional structures, all the way into making devices and understanding their properties. So <clears throat> how do we do this? So in our particular case, we're aiming to make these uniform, uniform nanostructures using a beautiful technique called reverse micelle templating to produce these two-dimensional arrays from solution. And I'm gonna go through some of the specifics of how we do that, but the basic process is just shown here in the process flow, where you start with some, some dye block copolymer surfactant, right? That, uh, that allows you to, to go from you know, particles in solution into a beautiful array. And the goal is something, uh, as I showed in the previous slide, again, here's my little schematic of a nice two-dimensional array on a surface. And just to prove that it's not a pipe dream, here is a, this is our schematic, and this, these, this is an AFM image of real particles that are produced in our lab, right? So it's possible to achieve almost a perfect periodic lattice using this kind of approach. So the approach itself is to um, <clears throat> start in solution, right? So the idea for, for industrial scale up or to make it um, accessible and cheap, we want to go from a solution process rather than using some of the more complicated systems. And we also would like it to be sort of more room temperature and easily um, uh, applicable to a wide variety of systems. So this is the approach that we use. Now, uh, this process starts with the surfactant material. And in general, we use an antiphilic unimer. So this is a material that has a hydrophobic end and a hydrophilic end. And <clears throat> in our case, we use polystyrene 2-vinyl pyridine, which has the polystyrene is the hydrophobic end and the 2-vinyl pyridine is, is the hydrophilic end. And because of its nitrogen with excess electrons, it has a tendency to interact with a large amount with large amounts of materials, and therefore um, allows the formation of a wide variety of systems. So this is our, our sort of starting point. And if you take this kind of unimer, which has, in our case, I've shown it here as sort of a gray squiggle and a yellow squished up portion. These two portions are the amphiphilic, are the hydrophilic and hydrophobic portions. And if you put them into solution above a critical concentration, they tend to sort of agglomerate together into a macromolecule referred to as a micelle, right? So above a certain concentration, they'll agglomerate into these, these semi-stable, semi quasi-static uh, particles. And um, in a polar solvent, this, this is formed the tr traditional micelle approach. You may have heard of micelles where the hydrophilic end is on the outside and the hydrophobic end is on the inside. And the one that we're probably the most familiar with the
If you take this a similar kind of it into not a polar solvent, but a non-polar solvent, you form a, what's called a reverse micelle, which is, I mean, purely from um, historical reasons that we call them reverse. But what it means is that the inside is the hydrophilic portion and the outside is the hydrophobic portion. And so this kind of structure allows a lot of, of um, potential for using solution chemistry in order to extract uh, nanoparticle structures. So what we end up doing with these reverse micelle type structures is by adding various kinds of precursors, salts or reducing agents or various mixtures of salts and reducing agents, you can do solution chemistry as if you were doing it in the beaker, but just inside what we call a nanoreactor. So the small scale reactor where the size of the micelle itself determines what the particle is gonna be, right? So you're just doing regular solution chemistry, but utilizing these tiny, tiny little beakers basically. And there, this is accessible to a wide variety of solution chemistries. There's three principal reaction types that people have been using. Uh, precipitation by double decomposition, reduction usually to form metals, and hydrolysis condensation, which is often used for making oxides. And <clears throat> because we have a wide, uh, we have accessible to us all of the different things that are done in aqueous chemistry, it allows it to, this kind of a system to be applied to a wide variety of, of systems, right? So including metals, as I mentioned, semiconductors, metal oxides, and in fact, different kinds of, of perovskite systems. At McMaster, for a number of years, we've been working on producing different kinds of functional nanoparticles for a wide variety of industries, predominantly in the energy sector, a little bit in sensing, and in magneto optics. And, um, and we're always targeting all of these different sorts of heterojunctions and composite materials, as well as just nanoparticles themselves. And we've been able to produce uh, a variety of metal organic uh, halide perovskites, which are really exciting right now in, uh, in the solar energy space and in, and in light emitting diodes, and um, as well as metal oxides, which is what we produce for a long time. And it's a, it's very, it's a very robust technique. Um, and some, for some metals, this is actually one of the first um, applications of, of this sort of reverse micelle technique by others is to, to make different kinds of metal systems. And we've also used it for dielectric halides. And there's a number of papers that we've published over the years that outline some of the different synthesis processes. And synthesis is really critical to the ability to produce nanoparticles from this approach because you have to be very care careful, right? So synthesis control is really critical. And for example, in 2019, we just published a paper looking at um, uh, methyl ammonium iodide, uh, lead iodide um, perovskite materials. And you know, what we discovered and what we were able to show is that if you pick the precursors incorrectly or you pick the order of the precursors incorrectly, it can lead to disaster, right? So if you start with the, the methyl ammonium iodide and use that as the stabilizing agent for the micelle, you can get beautiful nanoparticles. But if you start with with lead due to the, the strong interaction between lead and the, <clears throat> the nitrogen groups on the two vinyl pyridine, you end up having dissociation of the micelles and a big, a big mess rather than sort of nice organized nanoparticles. And a good case study for, for how important synthesis control is or, or understanding even the mechanisms that, that are occurring is something like iron oxide. So we produced um, magnetic gamma phase iron, iron two oxide, which is a, um, <clears throat> which is a, a very interesting um, sort of magnetic material that has a very high um, carry temperature and is something that's very desirable in, in sort of in, um, magnetic imaging or in uh, data storage, anything magnetic sort of properties. And what we were able to do is produce really very nice single crystalline nanoparticles using this approach where um, by <clears throat> tracking each point in the, the production synthesis method using Raman spectroscopy in particular, we were able to, to see sort of where the optimized point was to get the kind of properties that we wanted to get these really pure 100% gamma phase particles. And, um, and in fact, the, that complexation that I talked about before leads to a very nice uh, signature that we were able, that we established of these, these sort of peaks that exist when we see strong complexation between a salt and the, the vinyl pyridines that allows us to track this process under different conditions, right? And <clears throat> in fact, that kind of understanding of the mechanisms allowed us to produce tunable magnetic materials so that we could, we could go from purely antiferromagnetic materials as alpha phase of this particular structure 
all the way to the gamma phase, where it was a 100% um, gamma, just by tuning cer certain deposition parameters, right? And um, understanding that the micelle acts in, as a shielding environment, if we sort of tune the amount of, of water that can infiltrate inside of that micelle, in, in addition to the, the precursor itself, we can tune this behavior sort of across across the spectrum. So you can get kind of designer materials to order. And the benefit of this kind of thing is that it allows us to utilize different types of iron oxides for different applications. So for example, um, as I mentioned, we can get these sort of single crystalline nanoparticles that are 100% in the spinel phase. In this case, it's a mixture of um, mag magnetite and magmamite. So <clears throat> gamma Fe203 is often referred to as magmamite, where we can see a very high saturation magnetization that allows us to, uh, to utilize it, for example, for data storage. We can also just use purely gamma phase, so none of the magnetite, just magnemite, as a way to tune injection um, in organic photovoltaic devices by putting the nanoparticles on top of, of um, a polymer layer, for example, and applying a magnetic field to modify the, the injection characteristics. Um, and going beyond its magnetic properties, we can also utilize <clears throat> some of the properties of these systems, particularly the alpha phase, the hematite phase as a, as a, for water splitting. And by having a heterojunction between the alpha and the gamma phase, we can in fact see massive improvements in the water splitting efficiency for these sorts of systems. So being able to tune the behavior, understanding what the structure is, allows us to utilize, you know, the sort of tailor-made bespoke applications or bespoke nanoparticles for applications. And you know, beyond the ability to do this sort of tuning, we can also uh, deposit this material on various surfaces. And, you know, the, some of the examples that I showed in, in previously and in general, a very simple way of, of, of approaching it is to just spin coat the particles on the surface and, you know, allow nature to form this nice hexagonal array. But in fact, this sort of approach is, is amenable to, <clears throat> to a wide variety of deposition techniques. And it's possible to get similar particles with similar size and similar um, polydispersity index in terms of their diameters or their dispersion using different types of approaches, including spray coating, including dip coatings of various kinds, drop casting, et cetera, right? Shear coating, bl doctor blading, all these different approaches um, <clears throat> are um, accessible because it's coming from solution. And in fact, uh, not only is the ability to deposit in different methods um, universal, but it's also possible to deposit on different surfaces in a universal way almost. And um, the, the, the amount of particles, the type of the particles that come out, all these things are kind of agnostic to the surface energy, which makes it really exciting for uh, producing it on different, different surfaces that are generally hard to template or to hard to decorate with nanoparticles. Um, but, you, but you can accomplish that using this approach. And we've even developed in our lab um, some ways of approaching temperature sensitive or plasma sensitive materials that would that would maybe be destroyed if you just use the, the original approach using different transfer printing approaches to put it on polymer layers, for example. And so <clears throat> you know, we, we used el elastomeric stamps a couple of years ago. We also just recently published a paper where we utilized um, graphene as a mechanical support for the nanoparticles, which also allowed us to have sort of a nanoparticle graphene composite being put into devices in order to improve the efficiency. So these are the sorts of things that it's, a, it's available to it from this approach. And again, you know, the, a lot of the advantages of this sort of thing is that um, there's lots of knobs that you can turn to achieve different nanoparticle dispersions, right? So the reverse my, my cell templating approach has a great deal of tunability, allowing you to change the size, the spacing, the distribution, whether it's, it's organized or disorganized, just by changing various parameters, right? <clears throat> Including things like the loading ratio, how much salt you add, the solvents, the polymers, the time you can get, um, large variations in size or in, in you know, the uniformity of the particles. If you want to have two sizes, you can mix them together. There's lots of knobs that you can turn to achieve, achieve these dispersions. Additionally, there's lots of knobs that you can turn to achieve quality, right? So if you optimize the parameters, you can have very, very narrow um, <clears throat> diameter distribu size distributions down to about 2%, right? It's possible to get 2% uh, difference in the diameters at around 20 or 10 nanometers down to five nanometers. Um, 
but it's also, you know, if you have an unoptimized parameter set, you can also have large polydispersity. So it's really about understanding the formation process to control what it is that you're getting. And there's lots of factors that include things like the choice of solvent. You can go from aperiodic to periodic arrays. By the purity, you can, you can change the shape and the structure of the particle themselves from perfectly spherical to maybe to more triangular shapes. Um, by various post-processing, solvent annealing, temperature annealing, you can modify the structure into different types of, <clears throat> of um, material uh, sets from this micellular structure and taking advantage of dye block copolymer phase diagrams to, to change the structure, change the organization. And you can also change the coding parameters and the volume to change the density of particles and how, how large they are. Now, because there's a large set um, of, of parameters that you can modify and lots of knobs that you can turn, it's important to have a way to quantify what, what you've done in order to understand what is better and what is worse. And we're interested in, in aiming for highly ordered periodic arrays. So we developed a bunch of tools for quantifying disorder because order is easy to see. Disorder is much harder to understand what are, what's actually happening, what are the mechanisms. And so we developed um, this, what we call dislocate, which is a, a package in Mathematica that you, can, um, that you can use to extract sort of important spatial statistics characteristics. And we published that a couple of years ago in scientific reports. And in fact, the, um, <clears throat> the package itself is available for free on our website, or you can contact me through my email if you're, if you're interested in using it, or we can also collaborate with people to utilize the software ourselves on their own, their own uh, dispersions if they're interested in spatial statistics. And the excitement of this kind of, of these kind of tools is that it really allows you to, to really dig into what is really happening in the system. What kinds of order do we have? How much we can quantify the amount of disorder that we can see as a function of, of changing different parameters, right? So going from perfect order to perfect disorder. And, um, and in our package, we can do that in a variety of ways. The, the first one is really just what's called the, the Voronoi cells. This shows you the number of nearest neighbors, what kind of packing that you're seeing. And, but just by changing small parameters, you can have a big impact on, on the overall order of the system. Uh, we also can extract quite easily the pair correlation. So it tells us about the, long, the short range versus long range order. And um, we've incorporated Monte Carlo uh, type um, simulations within it just to sort of extract how far away it's going from from the the hexagonal lattice, for example, as well as um, <clears throat> as well as determining the, the what's called the bond order again to tell us about how far away it is from being hexagonal. Is it still hexatic, like a single like a liquid crystal, or is it actually fully disordered? And these are the kinds of parameters that we can extract, in, you know, sort of immediately. And the, the ability of these tools, so what our package can do is if you take an image, either an SEM image, an AFM image, or in fact, any, any two-dimensional image that has points on it, you can automatically extract the paracorrelation, these Voronoi cells that we color with different, different parameters. This is the, the areas, the Voronoi area deviation from hexagonal, pure hexagonal lattice. These are the bond order parameters, and these are the number of nearest neighbors. So you can extract all of these different pieces of information sort of automatically from an array. And, um, <clears throat> and you know, as a case study, one thing that you can do with that is to understand, for example, the impact of, of spin coding. And this is the one that we had described when we introduced this package in 2018, where by using different um, aspects of the spatial statistics, you can determine, for example, that that as we increase the spin speed, there's an increase in the spacing that you can quantify, right? You can see by the, the sort of first peak of these of the paracorrelation function, you can extract exactly how much the spacing has changed as a function of um, as a function of of uh, spin speed. You can also see that um, you know the paracorrelation function starts to sort of spin out or starts to to deviate to to smooth out. And you, where you no longer have these features related to the hexagonal lattice, indicating a loss of symmetry. And um, because we can quantify how hexatic, quote unquote, it is, we can extract the sort of bond order or the bond or parameters and, and determine what is the lattice disorder in these systems in a quantitative way. And um, utilizing all of the tools in the package, we can in fact see how that system at 2000 RPM, for example, has a really good array of, of neighbors and turns into a highly defective structure as we go to higher speeds, right? So these are the kinds of, of um, pieces of information we can sort of 
see the neighbor profile in terms of disorder. So these are the, the tools that we started out with. And what we're, we were interested in for a long time was particularly because I started out in, in organic devices. That's where I did most of my, that's where I did my sort of un, my PhD work, my graduate work, my postdoctoral work was really in looking at organic structures. Uh, we started, we were very interested in making nanotemplated electrodes to see if we could impact these devices and you know, producing an, an ordered array versus disordered array to see the impacts of that and the size and all these different kinds of things. And we incorporated them into um, <clears throat> organic solar cells using very standard P3HD PCBM structures. And, uh, and we were able to, by introducing our nanoparticles, uh, increase the <clears throat> short circuit current, uh, which was accompanied unfortunately by a loss of the VOC, but by tuning the whole transport layer, we could actually see a six times increase of the efficiency of these materials or of these types of, of systems, just through sort of tuning the interface using these nanoparticles. And, um, and if we looked at, for example, single carrier diodes, in this, in this case, in the previous case, we were using lithium fluoride. In this case, we're, we were making tin oxide nanoparticles. And we can see a significant increase in the amount of hole injection as a result of having this sort of nano, nanoparticle arrays on the surface. And, um, and that carries over if you're going from, from an OPV type device to single carrier diodes into OLEDs. So we were making blue OLEDs where we introduce nanoparticles. Again, in this case, this was lithium fluoride again, but we can also do it with tin oxide and other kinds of oxide materials. And by purely by introducing these nanoparticle arrays, we can see significant in, it in increase is in luminance and in efficiency for a wide variety of materials, particularly materials that have very, very deep HOMO levels that are hard to access by other types of, of um, interfacial parameters. Um, though if you use more traditional materials that have shallow HOMO levels that are closer to the um, <clears throat> to ITO's work function, the the ability that that particular gap becomes less important, and therefore the you know the amount of particles that you have on the surface is not necessarily helpful. But um, but we were able to understand how these nanoparticles are affecting the various aspects of the structure because of we have this ability to tune, we have, because we have this ability to try looking at different materials. And one of the, the interesting things about sort of tuning the system um, with order, particularly because there's an impact of the order versus disorder of our, of our nanoparticle systems at the interface, one thing that we, can, we saw is if you put an order dispersion, it's very helpful for tuning the molecular orientation and you can, you can change the angular distribution of, um, of light emitters, for example, through an ordered array on the surface <clears throat> because the the particle, the, the molecules tend to orient themselves relative to a surface, and by introducing a nanoparticle array, you can start to modify that that angular dependence. And similarly, if you use a disordered array, um, you can disrupt wave guiding modes that could exist in these systems, and therefore lead to increases. In this case, this was a white, uh, a white material, a white OLED system. Again, using different nanoparticles, you can start to disrupt. The, the behavior, you can couple plasmonic uh, systems together by having size tunable and spacing tunable. All of these different types of, of parameters are accessible to you to look at how it affects sort of device performance. And in fact, uh, one of the early things that we, the advantages of using this particular type of approach is that we have a tunability with, um, with because it, it's a full one-step process, you can actually just do it over and over again to increase the coverage. So one-time coding, for example, by spin coding of, in this case, lithium fluoride, we got sort of 14% coverage. And as you increased a second spin coding step, they start to fill in the, the parameters around uh, the existing particles and you get increasing coverage as a function of spin coding um, numbers. And this allowed us to, for example, tune the work function of the ITO surface in a controllable way that's, that's stable over, over a long time, just by the amount of particles that we deposit on the surface. And then it allows us to optimize where, where the charge injection is at, at its most. So for example, in our single diodes, having a, a single array of nanoparticles was very beneficial in terms of the, the charge injection, but by the time you have three times coverage, so it's closer to being a full layer, you get, um, you start to lose that injection properties. And in fact, this, this works for different types of, of material systems. And we saw that, you know, you need to have a sub layer array of particles in order to get 
adequate injection into these types of systems to get high, high efficiency and high performance for different kinds of, of light emitting and, and light absorbing organic devices. And we worked on that for, for a long time because it's still a very interesting area. Interfacial tuning is, is also, we're also branching into perovskite type systems where again, interfaces are a limiting factor. Uh, once the, the bottleneck of, of the forming of charges in the materials is very important, getting extracting those charge carriers to the to this external circuit becomes critical. But we've also uh, taken advantage of the fact that we can form different kinds of emissive nanoparticles, but the particles themselves, because of the micelle structure, because there's so little of them, you can actually make transparent films. So here we have some green emitting. Uh, these are MAPRI. These are um, organic organohalide perovskites again, uh, based on bromine in this case um, that emit in the green under UV light. And you can see that it's in you know at <clears throat> invisible wavelengths. It can be transparent, but it can emit in the green um, under under UV conditions, for example. And we published that work a couple of years ago. And the nice thing is that uh, this appears to be in a universal approach to organohalide perovskites. We could produce different, there are lots of different kinds of perovskites, um, MAPI, MAPRI, FAPI. Um, <clears throat> we've also expanded into other types of, of cations. And you can get really, really sharp emission and, and a color tunable sort of emission spectrum dependent on um, on the kind of doping that you can do. And, um, and though here you can see that in 2019, we weren't quite able to make very organized or very uniform um, methyl ammonium bromide type, uh, type structures. Last year, we, were, we did publish a paper that showed a very, very nice mechanism to getting to these, these very organized MAPRI type particles, right? Again, which are highly ordered on the surface. So <clears throat> this was kind of a, an overview of the research that we've been doing and, and that also highlights the, the potential of this kind of approach that for upscaling, because it's very cheap, it's very um, easy to do. It happens at amb under ambient conditions, it's from solution, you get very uniform particles. And so reverse micelle templating or deposition is really, I would, I would argue a powerful tool for controlled nanostructures, right? We get narrow, particle size distributions, there tends to be negligible contamination. I didn't show any XPS, but we've done a lot of XPS work on um, trying to <clears throat> figure out exactly if we get complete conversion under different situations. And there's really low energy consumption. You use an oxygen plasma or a hydrogen plasma to remove the micelles. You uh, deposit them under ambient conditions. There's no need for high temperatures. There's no need for, um, for exotic solvents. They're really, it's very uh, low energy consuming. And depending on the precursors. And in general, the, the ability to make these controlled tunable surfaces has really allowed us to explore a variety of, of electronic and optical properties. And we found that the classification of the dispersion, so the spatial statistics, how they're organized on the surface really allowed us to understand and control the properties so that we could tune our particles for particular applications. And <clears throat> so in, just as a summary, I would argue that uh, nanoparticles from the solution or from solution uh, reverse micelle deposition leads to a highly tunable, completely universal and heavily versatile approach to achieving uh, tailored particles, functional nanoparticles for a variety of applications. And so I just want to end by thanking the people who've been doing all this work. So this has been work for a number of years and that includes my, my group. Currently, uh, you know, we used to always take pictures in person. Now it's going to be, a, it's a Zoom. Zoom array of, uh, of my current group, but, uh, but these, are, these are my current uh, students. And I just wanted to acknowledge particularly um, a wide variety of students that have already graduated, including uh, Greg, Kenny, and Bertha, who, who really were fundamental in developing some of these synthesis techniques and getting uh, understanding of the micelles over, over the years, as well as Matt Bumstead, who, who developed that, that dislocate package and has been a driving force for our statistics work over a number of years. And you know, we've had many students come and go through the lab doing different kinds of synthesis, different kinds of deposition approaches, making devices, doing transfer printing. And, um, and of course we couldn't do this work without uh, acknowledging our collaborators. We've been very fortunate to have collaborators around the world um, <clears throat> in you know, helping us with different aspects, looking at different types of applications. And of course, our funding has been, you know, predominantly in Canada, but also from some international sources. And so we're very thankful for those. 
And so with that, I'd like to thank you very much for your attention.